Hey guys, it's Rick and it is time for my best of 2020 video. Uh, if you guys watch Crazy Joe's channel, you'll know him and I did a video, I believe on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, talking about our top five of 2020. However, I always like to wait until like the beginning of February to try to catch up on some stuff I've missed. Watched a ton of 2020 movies the last five weeks. Um, for the movies that are in my top 10, I had not seen a month and a half ago when I recorded that video with Joe. So my list is totally different from that video. Um, the other thing I want to mention before I dive in, if you guys aren't aware, I have a new P.O. box. I've been teasing that and this will be the last time I make a special mention of it. It's in the description box down below and on the description box of all my videos, I went through and changed every description back to the beginning so new p.o box is listed let's get into my favorite movies of 2020 uh the first thing i want to make mention of is i watched 98 films that were released in the year 2020 when i say they were released in 2020 the way i judge when a film gets released is usually by wikipedia the movie needs to be available to me in the year 2020 so things like nomadland minari that are in people's best of 2020 list will be on my 2021 list because Nomadland will be in theaters and on Hulu, like this upcoming week in February of 21, Minari hits streaming soon, I believe, like in uh, like Voodoo Rental in the next couple weeks. So those titles, in my opinion, are 2021 releases. They were, weren't available unless I was uh, a critic, which I'm not, or um, if I went to a festival or a, a virtual festival, I didn't do any of that. So for the general public, those movies won't be available until 2021. So they will be on my 2021 um, list. When I watch stuff, I keep a running list um, ranking things. <clears throat> so I've watched 98 films that were released 2020. Uh, I still have 49 movies that are on my to watch list from 2020. There's, I have lists from like the last five years that range from like 12 movies up to like 50 or 60 movies from each year that I want to see. I'll watch some of them eventually. I just can't keep up with the amount of content coming out. Um, I still have a bunch of movies on my to watch list. Stuff like Another Round, uh, Crude's A New Age, Greyhound, Hillbilly Elegy. News of the World, On the Rocks, One Night in Miami, Pieces of a Woman, St. Maud. Have not had a chance to watch any of that. So, um, St. Maud's another confusing one. I need to see. That might technically be a 21 release. I'm not 100% sure. I'll have to look into if that was available wide in 2020 or if it just hit the area. Um, excuse me. In 2021. So... Uh, this year is definitely, 2020 was a different year, as you guys know. Um, theaters shut down in mid-March, uh, so a lot of what we got to see in theaters this year, which I don't think, I think I only saw one movie in theaters that's on my top two movies in theaters. They're on my top ten list. Um, you know, most of what I saw in January was awful. I think three or four of those movies were on my worst of the year list. And this is the first time where I think half of my list is from streaming services because stuff was just released differently this year. And there was lots of things that were not on my radar in the beginning of the year that ended up being on my top of uh, top 10 list. There's a ton of stuff that was supposed to come out that might not come out in 2021, let alone, you know, 2020. So we're going to dive in. Uh, I want to mention a handful of movies for honorable mentions. The first being Soul, which is on Disney Plus, Disney Pixar's Soul. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Was not my favorite animated film of the year, personally. We'll talk about that during the list. Uh, Run, which was on Hulu, starring Sarah Paulson. Really enjoyed it. A psychological thriller. Not really a horror film. I would say a psychological thriller is the best way to put it. Really, I, I couldn't recommend that enough. The Devil All the Time, which is on Netflix, uh, all-star cast, Tom Holland, Robert Pattinson, 
a ton of other familiar faces. Enjoyed that. Um, it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, but it was still a really good movie. And then Antebellum, which I've seen on people's worst of the year list. I, I don't know why. I personally really enjoyed it. Um, I've talked to a few of my friends that have seen it. They enjoyed it. So there seems to be hate for Antebellum, but for me, it just missed being in my top 10 by one spot. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I can't wait to revisit it, honestly. I think it'll have good rewatchability. And uh, yeah, so it is time to get into my top 10 list. I only own five of these movies physically because I believe the other five are all from streaming services. Let me check. One, One's not out yet on physical. It will be. Um, and then two three, four of them are streaming services and I own the other five. So I'll own the six that are available on physical. Um, but the other four are on streaming services. So highly unlikely that I'll get to own them physically. So the first movie, number 10 on my list is Judd Apatow's The King of Staten Island with the highly divisive Pete Davidson as the lead actor. Uh, this movie is semi autobiographical semi-autobiographical. Um, what I mean by that is um, Pete Davidson, his dad was a firefighter who died in 9-11. He passed away in the Twin Towers um, while uh, in the line of duty as a firefighter. Um, there's other things like he lives with his mom still to this day, um, his mom and his sister. He He's from Staten Island, New York. So there were things that like ranked true to his life, which Judd Apatow has a tendency to do. Trainwreck was semi-autobiographical with Amy Schumer. And uh, she's also another divisive figure. So I really enjoyed this movie. Um, I had high, high expectations. And I think it matched them pretty well. My problem with Judd Apatow movies is his runtime. I think this movie was two hours and ten minutes or two hours and... 15 minutes. It probably should have been an hour and 45 minute film. Um, Pete Davidson really had a good year in 2020. This isn't the last time we'll talk about him. Um, plus I watched The Dirt in 2020, which he starred in in a smaller role, but still really good. Um, you know, when Pete Davidson starts hanging out with the firefighters in this film, I think the movie like just accelerates and is highly entertaining. Like part of me would want to see a sequel of just him with the firefighters, Bill Burr's character and the other guys, because the camaraderie, the friendship, the hazing, like it was all very fun. Uh, the thing I will say with this, if you're not a fan of Pete Davidson, don't watch the movie or just avoid it. Cause you're not going to like it. You're going to be annoyed he just is one of those actors where if you don't like him, you're not, I mean, this is basically him playing himself to an extent. So the King of Staten Island, I personally really enjoyed. Uh, I give it a three and a half out of five, which is very low for a top 10 list, but that's the kind of year 2020 was. Uh, so number 10, King of Staten Island. Number nine, and this will throw some people off. I mentioned this in Crazy Joe's video, is a horror film, and that is... I'm throwing stuff. Um, we're going to keep it in because I'm not editing. That's how I roll. I don't edit videos. I just leave all the craziness in. The Lodge, which stars Riley Keough. Um, also, Alicia Silverstone is in the movie in probably one of the most shocking parts of the film. Uh, basically, this is a movie that um, was shot in a very unique way. Uh, it has like a lot of fisheye lens shots in the movie. Uh, it felt very uneasy and creeped out throughout the film. Uh, basically, a woman is dating a, a guy who has two kids. They're going to go to a lodge to celebrate Christmas that they have. Uh, the dad has to go somewhere for work temporarily. They get all this snow and things start getting weird in the uh, the lodge. So... Uh, it's unsettle unsettling. There's kids in the movie, which kids in horror movies always kind of freaks me out, especially having a 10 year old son now. Um, but I really, really enjoyed the lodge. I thought it was very well done personally. 
Uh, I thought it was very creepy. Riley Keough was fantastic in the movie. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I just really enjoyed it. Um, I own it on physical as you can see because I enjoyed it so much. So The Lodge is my number nine favorite movie of the year. Number eight is a Hulu film, uh, which also stars Pete Davidson, as I mentioned before. And that is Big Time Adolescence. Excuse me. So the night before we watched Big Time Adolescence, we had watched Pete Davidson stand up and I was severely disappointed. Um, I thought it was unfunny. I thought he was dressed very weirdly um, and just was bummed. I'm a huge stand-up fan and the, the stand-up was not very good in my opinion. So <clears throat> the next night we check out this movie and it's about uh, a young kid who's probably in high school. I want to say he's like 16, 17. His older sister had dated Pete Davidson. They broke up after a little bit of time. But the younger kid who's the main character really had like a friendship with Pete Davidson, liked hanging out with him, and he continued to hang out with him uh, and his friends. They would play video games. He would drink with them even though he was underage. He would just hang out with them. And um, it, it was really funny. It was heartwarming. It was heartbreaking in points. Um, I just thought it was funny. Uh, Pete Davidson kind of playing himself to an extent, but more like he's a screw up who hangs out with his buddies. He has a gorgeous girlfriend who isn't happy and you can tell she's not happy because he just wants to lay around and smoke weed and play video games and not get a job or do anything productive. <clears throat> and the kid looks up to Pete Davidson's character and I enjoyed the movie. I thought it was really well done. Um, I enjoyed it obviously more than King of Staten Island, but I thought he was great in both movies. Big Time Adolescence, a three and a half, is my number eight film of the year. Um, number seven, which was another film we saw in theaters this year. Um, I own this on physical, obviously, as I mentioned, and that is Disney's Onward, uh, my favorite animated film of 2020. Um, <clears throat> so this is voiced by Tom Holland and Chris Pratt as the two leads. So Spider-Man and Star-Lord. And if you have siblings, if you've, <clears throat> excuse me, dealt with the loss of a parent, um, this movie I think will hit you differently than anybody else, a little kid or just someone who hasn't experienced any of that other stuff I've mentioned. This movie is very enjoyable. Um, still probably like halfway up my, my favorite Pixar films of all time. <clears throat> and Soul was also very good, but this one hit me more. Uh, I thought it was funny that it had action adventure elements uh, like I said it was a very heartwarming story for me and um, I just really enjoyed it I saw it in theaters and we watched it again when it came to Disney plus so I've seen it twice this year it was one of three movies I watched twice in 2020 so onward is number seven I gave this a four out of five really really enjoyed this one so onward Next up is a movie I watched on HBO Max. It's an HBO exclusive film based on a true story, and that is Bad Education, uh, which stars Hugh Jackman and Allison Janney. It's basically about the largest public school embezzlement in history. Um, you know, there's lots of secrets that the main characters have. Uh, when everything starts to unravel, it is crazy crazy what happened in this circumstance and situation. Uh, it offered a mix of like humor, drama, suspense, crime elements, and I just really, really enjoy it. Uh, also, Geraldine Viswanathan, who recently I've been obsessed with. She was in Blockers. She was in the Broken Hearts Gallery. She's on the show Miracle Workers, which I want to check out. Uh, she plays like a high school newspaper reporter. And uh, she kind of breaks the news, if you will. And uh, I really enjoyed Bad Education. I gave it a 4 out of 5. It is available on HBO Max if you guys want to check it out. I recommend it for sure. Number 5 is an Amazon Prime exclusive. 
and that is Sound of Metal, which I also give a four-star review to. Riz Ahmed is fantastic in the lead performance. He plays Ruben, who is a heavy metal drummer. He's in a heavy metal band with his girlfriend. Um, and the movie starts out at a show, kind of displaying like what kind of following they have. And um, <clears throat> the typical day, he gets up and turns a record on and just does different things and they live in like a um an rv kind of and travel around all their gigs and it's like a two-piece band i think if i'm not mistaken that they're in and uh he starts to rapidly lose his hearing and um so he has to basically uh accept that music probably isn't in his future because if you can't hear it's going to be tough to play the drums or play music. Um, he goes to a compound that's uh, basically for all deaf people and it shows his experiences, what happens with him. He There's an option for a surgery that's incredibly expensive that he talks about, thinks about because he thinks he's ready to get the surgery and be back to normal. Um, but the sound design in the film is outstanding. Lots of great performances. Like I said, Riz Ahmed was fantastic in the film. Sound of Metal is my number five movie of the year. I really, really enjoy it. Number four, a movie that came out of left field, smacked me in the face. I was sent this to review during quarantine digitally. Loved it so much that as soon as I could, I bought it on physical media. And that is... Guns Akimbo, starring Daniel Radcliffe and Samara Weaving, which is basically a mashup of Crank, Nerve, Dread, Hardcore Henry, rolled up into one. I really, really enjoy this. It's about an online game called Schism, um, which is like an underground deathmatch thing where you vote who goes against people and uh, is so much fun. It is gory. It's profane. The music is great. It's just a fun time. I really, really enjoyed this one. Like I said, it came out of left field for me. Was not expecting it. Um, and Daniel Radcliffe and Samara Weaving have great chemistry together, which makes the movie that much more fun to watch. So Guns of Kimbo, number five on the year. I gave this a four out of five. Really enjoyed that one. Um, number, did I say number five on the year? Number four on the year. I gave it four stars. Sorry about that. Number three, my favorite movie I got to see in theaters this year, and that is Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman, uh, which stars, let's see, Matthew McConaughey, Charlie Hunnam, Henry Golding, Michelle Dockery, uh, Hugh Grant, and then my favorite part of the movie, Colin Farrell. It's an R-rated gangster flick, uh, Guy Ritchie, lots of profanity, lots of violence, um, but just such a fun movie. Henry Golding was probably the weakest point of the film for me. But this was just a blast to watch. Like I said, very violent. Um, but great performances throughout. A fantastic story. Uh, Matthew McConaughey wants to get out of the marijuana business that he is like a leader in. And all these people are trying to rob him, take advantage of him. And it kind of shows that story. But Colin Farrell's character, the coach was my favorite part of the movie and stole the show for me personally. Really enjoyed him in this. And uh, the gentleman, like I said, saw it in January, was my uh, favorite movie I saw in theaters and number three overall on the year. I give this a four out of five. I need to revisit this. I want to rewatch this at some point um, because I haven't seen it since I saw it in theaters, but I remember absolutely loving it. So the gentleman is number three. Number two is... Not yet released on physical media. We actually paid $20 to rent this one on Voodoo. And that is Promising Young Woman, which I gave a 4.5 out of 5 to. Um, stars Carrie Mulligan as a woman who is scorned. She wants revenge. She had something traumatic happen to her and her friend in college. Uh, college, high school, it's kind of, I guess college technically. <clears throat> um, her performance is funny, terrifying, vindictive, uh, dedicated. She just is fantastic in the movie. Um, she had something that happened to her and she did not want to 
live her life. She want, she was focused on getting this revenge, righting a wrong, and the movie tells that story. Uh, it can be viewed as a dark comedy for sure in parts, uh, a revenge film in parts, and just just a well done um, film. Like I said, the music choices are great. Uh, Bo Burnham is in the film. He's great. And it was just really good. Start asking questions five minutes in and like it just built up and just kept rolling and rolling. And then when the film ends, it's just, man, it is just well done. Uh, also, Britney Spears Toxic is in the movie. And there's a version in this movie of that song that was perfect for a horror uh, thriller suspense film. So kudos to them. Promising Young Woman, four and a half out of five. My number two movie of the year. Number one film of the year. Drum roll, drum roll please. A Netflix exclusive, The Trial of the Chicago 7, uh, which was written and directed by Aaron Sorkin. And man, oh man, this movie was awesome. Um, so many great performances. The one that sticks out in my head the most is Sasha Baron Cohen, but also um, Eddie Redmayne, Mark Rylance, Michael Keaton. I'm going to butcher this name, so I'm going to try my best. Yahya Abdul-Mateen II was fantastic in the film. Um, just so many great performances throughout. Joseph Gordon-Levitt's good in the film. Uh, Frank Langella is fantastic as a, a judge that you will despise and hate. Um, it is a funny movie. It is a powerful film. It is culturally relevant today. Um, just such a good movie. It jumps right into the trial uh, of this group of people, whether they be leaders of the Democratic, uh, the Young Democrats, whether they be uh, members of the Black Panthers, whether they be just people who are looking to right wrongs. It, it is the story of these seven different individuals who all kind of have different stories. And uh, it's so it's a courtroom drama. But then as the movie moves on, you kind of get flashbacks of what actually happened. Um, like I said, it is historical events. It is humor, it is courtroom drama, it's violent protest footage, and just a highly rewatchable film, uh, just a fantastic film with great performances throughout. I really hope Sasha Baron Cohen gets nominated for an Oscar for this performance. I could see, uh, realistically, three of the five best supporting actors could be from this movie. Because there's not really a lead actor. It is a bunch of, almost like a 12 Angry Men, where there's multiple people who give fantastic performances. This was no different. The Trial of the Chicago 7. Highly recommend. It is the only movie I watched from 2020 that got a 5 out of 5 from me. I don't give out 5s incredibly often if you go back and watch previous best of videos. Um, it's kind of rare for me to give out a 5 out of 5 review. So I love Trial of the Chicago 7. It's my number one film of the year. And that is it, guys. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to give it a thumbs up if you did. Subscribe if you guys don't do so already. Hit the bell notification so you guys know when new videos drop to the channel. Check out the description box down below where you can find links to my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Letterboxd. I'm now down to movie on Letterboxd. Blu-ray.com profile, Amazon wishlist, eBay page. All that can be found down below along with my new... Uh, P.O. Box and email address all can be found down below. So thank you guys for watching. And as always, until next time, who's down to movie?